Greetings, hope you are having a wonderful day. And I turn my attention away from Hobbes to John Locke. Uh, Locke lived from 1632 to 1704. So he came up a bit uh, after Hobbes, who was 1588 to 1679. And it's intriguing because in political theory courses I took, uh, Hobbes and Locke in many ways were seen as antagonists, as opponents. And I understand the reasoning, right? Uh, I talked about how last time Hobbes was an advocate for a monarchy and Locke for a republic. Um, Hobbes has a more sinister view that people are very self-interested. Some would even say evil. Uh, Locke sees people as basically uh, good, but self-interested, uh, egoistic, which is what we saw with both Machiavelli uh, and Hobbes. Um, Locke introduces this concept of natural rights, life, liberty, and property, and later modified by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence to Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Happiness. And Hobbes says that people only retain the right of self-preservation. So certainly they, there are some things they disagree on. However, I, I see Locke more as an extension uh, of Thomas Hobbes, as a modification of Hobbes because they agree, at least in my mind, on a lot more things than they disagree on. Uh, both Hobbes and Locke are social contract theorists. They both believe that political authority comes from the people. They both believe that government is artificial and it exists to serve the people. They both also believe that people have the right to get rid of a bad government. Remember for Hobbes, a bad government was one that could not provide order and security and protect the self-preservation of the people. For Locke, the bad government is one that cannot protect the natural rights of the people. So I see them having just as many things in common as things that they disagree on. Just a few words about Locke. Locke uh, actually viewed himself more as a scientist than as a political philosopher. Uh, his first love was meteorology. So who knows, in today's world, John Locke might have been a weatherman. Uh, he was also very interested in chemistry. Uh, his occupation was actually as a physician and as a doctor, and he became famous by doing a very delicate liver uh, operation on a nobleman, Mr. Shaftesbury, uh, that was successful. Uh, Locke got caught up in this English Civil War that I mentioned earlier. This war fought largely between Catholics who were backing the crown, backing the king, the Stuarts, and the parliamentarians, the people who were fighting against uh, the authority of the king. Uh, and John Locke was an advocate for the parliament and for a limited republic. And during this civil war, Locke had to leave England for five years, from 1683 to 1688, where he fled to Holland. And after the glorious revolution uh, in 1688, in the British Bill of Rights, which now placed parliament as supreme, uh, Locke then came back uh, to England. Uh, Locke was a believer that knowledge comes through experience, that essentially we are born with a blank slate, a blank mind, and that our mind is then filled with our experiences. So there's a little background to Locke that is not in your notes per se. Uh, but thought that it would uh, be useful to give you a context uh, for John Locke, who is so very, very important uh, in understanding uh, our founding fathers. Uh, so you should know for exam purposes that Locke is a classical liberal. Uh, classical liberals advocate limited government. Uh, they are believers in individual liberties, not civil rights, but civil liberties. Uh, Locke has a profound influence on Thomas Jefferson. The Declaration of Independence, if I move my head, oh, I'm moving it the wrong way, 
But if you see the document uh, behind me on the screen, uh, this is in my kitchen. That is the Declaration of Independence that is uh, behind me. So uh, I guess I have a prop for this lecture. Uh, uh, probably no one here knows someone with the Declaration of Independence in their kitchen, but remember what I do. Be nice to me. Uh, Locke also influences uh, the, the notion of civil liberties, and we see that uh, in the Bill of Rights. Uh, our first 10 amendments to the Constitution, we'll talk about this uh, in the second section of the course, but essentially the Bill of Rights, and I'm stealing from Hugo Black here, who was a very, very famous, very prominent Supreme Court Justice. When asked about the Bill of Rights, Hugo Black said that in his mind, the Bill of Rights are kind of uh, the thou shalt not directed at government, right? That thou shalt not abridge individuals freedom of speech press religion petition assembly right thou shalt not infringe on the criminal defendant rights of individuals right they don't have to testify against themselves in court they have the right to counsel they cannot be subjected to cruel and unusual punishment and there are many more that's just a few examples one that's often ignored in one of the influences in our governmental system that I think you really see with John Locke is the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment says that no person shall de be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. And the reason that that is so Lockean is when John Locke talks about the natural rights of the people, they are life, liberty, and property. So the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment uses Locke's natural rights and puts them directly into our Constitution. Now, even in our Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson changes the words natural rights to unalienable rights and they get modified to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But clearly, clearly you see the influence of John Locke on both our Constitution, the First Ten Amendments, and the Fourteenth Amendment, and even before our Constitution. Our rationale for revolution was rooted in the social contract theory and natural rights of John Locke. So what are Locke's contributions to classic liberalism? Well, first of all, the individual is more important than the state. It is people that create the state. And so sovereignty or ultimate power is in the hands of the people. B, that individuals are capable of both independence and self-determination that freedom is natural, that people are both principled and capable of self-rule. I didn't write this down, but if you want to write an extension of this idea, as I was reading through the chapter, what I wrote in the margin was that the moral role of government is to protect the natural rights of the people and that free people enter society and form a government primarily to preserve their private property. Three, Locke is a liberal in the sense that he believes that progress is possible in human affairs. He believes that people are rational, so does Hobbes, by the way, and that they can reform and improve their societies. Now, Hobbes would disagree with that, and say that people are not community oriented, Locke says they are, that people cannot reform and improve their societies because they're too egoistic and self-interested and they won't sacrifice their individual interests for the community. Now Locke says that that is true to an extent, but only if government does not exist. Locke agrees that people are self-interested and without government, uh, they would tend to do things to advance their interest, which is what Hobbes had said. 
and that things like looting may occur. And that's one of the reasons you need government. One of the natural rights of the people is life, liberty, and property. So certainly government is there to provide a rule of law and social order. And so certainly Locke would agree to an extent with Hobbes, but would say that Hobbes's agenda is too limited. Government is not primarily about protecting people's lives because people aren't nearly as bad as Hobbes would have you believe. Primarily, government exists to protect the liberties and property of people. Classic liberals say the state power should be limited. The role of the state, again, is to enforce the laws and protect the natural rights, which remember for Locke, are life, liberty, and property. The core of Lockean philosophy to me, and these are kind of my language, the core of Lockean philosophy is that there is a sphere of individual rights that government should respect and leave untouched. And certainly think about our Bill of Rights, right? A sphere of individual rights that we should have the right to criticize the conduct of public officials. She should, we should be allowed to peacefully march and demonstrate that we should have the right to determine what church to go to or to decide not to go to any church at all. And so those are just a few. There are many others. But one of the ideas that comes out of Lockean philosophy that is manifested in the American constitutional system is that John Locke is an advocate for separation of powers. John Locke is an advocate that the legislative branch of government should be the leading and should be the most powerful branch of government because they determine the laws of society. Now, he acknowledges that an executive is needed to enforce the laws. And he also added that a judiciary is preferable to interpret the laws because the legislature cannot be an impartial arbiter of the laws that they themselves write. Notice the influence on the American political system. First of all, what is Article I of the Constitution? Article I of the Constitution deals with our Congress. Our founding fathers believed and they intended for Congress to be the leading and the most powerful branch of government. They also created a separate executive to enforce the laws and, of course, created a Supreme Court and a later a federal court system to interpret the laws. So the notion that the legislature should be the leading institution, the most important, uh, was one that our founding fathers took from Locke. The idea that there should be three separate institutions was inspired as an idea by Locke and, of course, extended upon by Montesquieu, because Montesquieu actually got into the actual operations of the institutions of government. Locke kind of introduced it as an idea. Now, Many claim that Locke's major disagreement with Hobbes is in the arena of human nature and how the state of nature, which remember the state of nature is merely life without government, a state of anarchy, or here's the way I would put it, a state of absolute freedom and equality. Hobbes, remember, believed that in the state of nature, there would be a perpetual state of war that ceaseth only in death. Locke's belief is more charitable because Locke believes that God gave us a capacity for reason, to aid in the search for truth, that God gave us an innate natural aversion to misery, a desire for happiness. And so in the state of nature, life would be primitive, free, autonomous, 
but with a desire for private property. In the next mini lecture, I'll investigate these assumptions of Locke and conclude.